Well, it's great to be here. Can you hear me okay without the mic, or should I use the mic? Okay. Everybody here in the back? Okay, all right, then maybe I don't use it. Got to put the water up there. That's not where I normally like to put it, because I do believe in the separation of water and electronics. <laughs> um, they don't go very well together. Well, what I want to do is just talk about some basic behavior things. You know, I was uh, told that most of the people here today might be uh, have small herds, might have some horses. So I was going to do a more general talk today than my regular cattle talk. Okay, this is how we design facilities. And I saw some cattle this morning that didn't need any facilities. They were just, they just brought them in the shed. They stood there, put the milker on them, no head stanchion, no nothing. I get them trained well enough. That's possible, but that's 12 head. That's not going to work out on, a, on an extensive cattle ranch, that's for sure. You know, what a lot of people don't realize about cattle and horses, because they get the wide angle vision, but they do have one little area of depth perception. You know, and you're putting the animals through the handling facility and they stop at a shadow, stop at some, uh, they see a car or something like that, see a shadow, the animal will stop and put its head down. Give it a chance to do that. Because if you just push them up there and push them, then they're going to turn back on you. Give them a chance to look. And then you all know they've got a blind spot behind their rear end. Here's another little basic principle. You bring them up to the corrals, they got a little bit excited. Give them 20 to 30 minutes to calm back down. Calm animals are easier to handle. You say, well, I don't have time to wait for them to calm down. Yeah, but you have time to fix the broken gate. And that's going to take longer than 20 or 30 minutes. Now, what are signs that animals are calm? One of the big things that I really work with with a lot of students is teaching them what are the signs that an animal's getting upset, that an animal's calm. It's really important to understand those signs. Well, during milking today, your cattle were all chewing the cuds. The ears are forward, they're not pooping. They start pooping and tail switching. That's your warning, they're starting to get upset. Heads up, looking around, getting more vigilant. And you see the whites of the eyes, your animal's really getting upset. Well, that's calm right there. Tail switching, and the more upset they get, there's no flies on them, the more they're going to switch the tail. Um, horses sweating. You know, some of this seems like elementary stuff. And people that are really, really good stock people instinctively know this, but they don't know how to communicate it. Find it. And I remember one time talking to a really good horse person, and he says, well, you've got to know when the horse is calm and the horse is upset. Well, how do you know when the horse is upset? Well, tell me. You can't tell me to look for horse vibes. How am I going to train somebody on that? Well, these are some of the things you look at. Now, you've got the one that's a little more flighty there in the back. Now, some other work that we've done, <laughs> a little more flighty. Let's see if I can find the arrow here. Well, we can't seem to get the arrow to, oh, wait a minute. Back up. I want to get the arrow here to work. Can't seem to get the arrow to work I wanted to point to. Maybe I'll just do it on the screen. Some of the work we've been doing is looking at the little hair whorls that cattle have on their foreheads. And one of my students, Connie Flerker, some of her latest work has been on differences in the behavior, individual differences in Angus mama cows on how they take care of their calves. And some cows are hyper vigilant. They see a strange vehicle, heads up looking. Some cows call a calf. Others don't call the calf, and some bad moms walk off and leave it. And some of the first temperament work uh, that was ever done, my student did a long time ago, and we found that calm cattle have better weight gain. But on the other hand, you don't want to select for a bunch of Holsteins, because beef cattle do need to get out and forage. So this brings up the really important thing of optimum. My approach to temperament selection is let's go out and get rid of the crazies ones that have busted the gates, treed you in the pickup, let's get rid of those. But you don't want to turn beef cattle in a bunch of Holsteins. And beef cattle over the years have gotten a whole lot calmer. Another thing I'm seeing now, and I'm really worried, and I want to have this as a warning, now that we've got the genomic power tools, be careful what you wish for, because I'm seeing some fancy cattle with horrible leg conformation. Too straight in the back. I call that toe slippers on bulls. They got a, cro a crooked claw like this, toe in, toe out. These guys are going to have trouble walking. And I'm starting to see some of the mistakes getting repeated in cattle that pigs made 20 years ago. 
that's not a good thing to be doing. Some people think we can just breed seed stock on the numbers. I'm going, no. We still need to look at animals to make sure that they're functionally correct. And uh, yes, I went down to the Denver Stock Show. I can't believe all the fake black baldies I saw down there. Yes, and they were not Anguses. Okay, there's an animal switching his tail, getting a little bit upset. I'm not a fan of nose tongs. I think we have to look at everything we do in agriculture and go, how will that play on YouTube? And uh, one thing that's good is beef doesn't have and bison don't have some of the controversies that pigs and layers have got. Be thankful you don't have their controversies. Also, agriculture's done some really stupid things. And it's mainly been pig people and dairy people getting egg gag laws passed. What does that tell the public? That tells the public that you're guilty. Things have gotten a whole lot better. I've been around for 40 years, handling in the 70s, 80s, absolutely beyond awful. And it's gotten a whole lot better. The problem is the public doesn't know about it. That's the thing that frustrates me. And we're getting young people today further and further away from the world of all practical things. But there's one good news. 57% of young people consider ranchers a credible source of information. And only 17% think food manufacturers are credible. That's a white eye right there. You got a really upset animal and you start to see that white eye. That's actually a scientifically validated measure. You know, that's uh, not very happy right there. You know, watch what your ears are doing. See how the zebra and the horse have an ear on each other and then the other ear is on me. I want to get you to get away from words. Animals don't think in words. They think in pictures, smells, touch sensations. It's a sensory-based world. And you start to understand some of these indicators, you can avoid a lot of problems. Well, here's a pig just stopping at the metal strip. These are the kinds of distractions you can have in a facility. It doesn't matter if it's pig shape, cattle. They tend to stop wherever there's a change. Give your lead animal a chance to stop, take a look, and move on. Sunny days are a lot worse. You won't have shadows on a cloudy day, but you'll have shadows on a sunny day. You know, I've been around for a long time. Why do I have to still keep talking about chains hanging down in chutes? Because people are not removing them. Get down in your chute and see what they're seeing. Some of the worst things for scaring cattle is vehicles parked along the handling facility. You know, get rid of the vehicles parked along the handling facility. Get rid of the dogs biting cattle. Because all that does is teach cattle how to kick. And then they go on down the supply chain and they're kicking at people. Yes, I've been there at the packing plant, nearly had my head kicked off the double-barreled cannon. And that's an animal that's had dogs bite it. Another thing about cattle, since they're a visual thinker, a man on a horse is a different picture than a man on the ground. And you can have a situation where they have a three-foot flight zone to the man on the horse. But when they meet their first man on foot at the sale barn or feed yard or packing plant, they now have a 50-foot flight zone in a 30-foot pen. That gets a little bit dangerous. So one of the things we can do to improve safety down the supply chain is have them learn how to go in and out of pens with a person on foot. <coughs> but think about it. Man on a horse looks different than a man on foot. They're visual thinkers. Now, a common question I get asked is, do they know <coughs> they're going to get slaughtered? I found that they behave the same way in both places. That was one of the first questions I had to answer when I first started. Now, I've got some videos up online, Beef Plant Video Tour with Temple Grandin, and it's got about 90% likes. You know, the thing is, is what's chores to you is interesting to the public. How many people here have friends like in Chicago or some of the big cities like that? Well, maybe we need to be putting up good stuff you're doing on your ranch. Put up good stuff you're doing with the land. There's a lot of people back east that think ranchers ought to be just chucked off the land. You know, good ranchers do all kinds of things to improve the land. We need to be showing the public that. You provide a water source, yes, the wildlife drink out of that too. You're doing a lot of good things. The problem is, Nobody knows about it. The other thing that's a big problem in all this era of social media is people just only talking to their tribe. 
The Center for Food Integrity calls it the tribalization of communication. And a lot of young people, there's some young people today, 20% get all of their news off of Facebook. That's not a good thing. It's getting to where we're getting young people today separated from the world of practical things. So they expect perfection because they've taken cooking, sewing, woodworking, all of those kinds of things out of the schools. Gigantic big mistake. Here's a little hint. Animals don't want to come into the squeeze chute. Try putting a piece of cardboard on the back half of the squeeze chute. Then they don't see us standing there. That's just a real simple thing that you can do that's going to make it easier to get the cattle to come into the squeeze chute. Now here's a cow's eye view where they don't see any people through the sides, but they can see a lighted way in the front. They don't like going into the dark. You've got your cattle handling facility inside a building. It's like a black hole and it's real bright outside. They're not going to go in. If they can see through that building, then they're going to go in. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of non-slip flooring. <coughs> One really simple thing you can do is making sure they're not slipping around in the squeeze chute. That makes cattle get really excited, gets them really scared. Now when I say excited, what's really happening to these animals is they're getting fearful. And fear is a proper scientific word. Okay, let's see how good you are on your observation. How many people notice that animal is looking at the sunbeam? Okay, did you raise your hand if you noticed it before I talked about it? Oh, we need to get a whole lot better on observation. Now, you're as bad at, you know, what, you know who I find is good on this? I show this same slide to the 4-H kids, half the children will see it. And the reason for that is kids are more visual. That's why they see it. Fear of falling, it makes them just panic. Here's a bad situation, we've got bad reflections, we're headed straight into the sun. Animals tend to go from a dark place to a brighter place, but they're not going to go into blinding sun. So if you want to load a truck and it's going into the sun, maybe change the time of day you load the truck. When you lay out your corrals, don't put your squeeze chute headed right into the sun. That doesn't work very well. You've all been on the freeway, blinded in the sun. Rapid movement. It makes the dog chase, and it makes cows and horses run away. There's a very different um, reaction on the two different species. But you have a real slow movement, like this special camera that was used in the movie, the thing that's really weird is you can take this camera and put it down around the heads of cattle and it's like it's not there. They don't view that as a threat. Yelling and screaming, people are getting better on handling. You know, there's a lot less yelling and screaming. Animals can differentiate be between equipment noise, which they can learn to ignore, and people yelling and screaming at them that's directed at them. They know that's directed at them. Yeah, we got to get our mouths shut. People are getting a whole lot better on this. Don't surprise an animal. Any animal you have, light tickle touches they don't like, don't pat animals, stroke it. You got a horse, stroke it. Don't pat them. They interpret that as hitting. And of course, don't surprise an animal. Yes, and you all know they kick out to the side. If you're working with a hydraulic chute, there's an optimal pressure for holding your animal. Not too tight, not too loose. The mistake a lot of people make is it fights it to squash it tighter. And there's a lot of interest now in different kinds of squeeze chutes. You can get ones where they're hinged on the bottom, ones where the sides remain straight, when it closes in. And a lot of cattle are getting really broad. I mean, some of these hangers, they're so wide. So the type of squeeze chute where the sides stay straight may be better. You might want to put a brisket bar in there so they can't lay down. But I don't like a chute that just squeezes on one side, throws her off balance. Also, I've seen some kind of homemade welding company squeeze chutes where you've got to be Godzilla to operate them. I don't think that's very good. How are we going to have a calm attitude towards cattle if you've you got to be Godzilla to work the chute? Because the leverage isn't very well designed. Well, we know better than to tie lead ropes to yourself, but there was a child killed in Colorado tying lead rope to himself. Now here's the flight zone. You see how those animals are going around the person kind of like a bubble? You've got animals moving out a gate. You can position yourself so they kind of flow around the bubble formed by you. 
Now, your cattle don't have any flight zone. You didn't just lead yours. We were talking today about how to do operant conditioning to train them. They don't have any flight zone. So what determines the size of the flight zone? Amount of contact with people, quality of that contact, and there's some genetic differences. So what's the difference between high-strung cattle and calmer cattle genetically? <coughs> high-strung animals frighten easily at a sudden novel stimulus. You know, like a Hereford wouldn't get as excited as maybe a Solaire to a sudden novel in stimulus. <coughs> if you have an animal in the chute, one thing you don't want to be doing is stand at its head and poke its butt. That's another thing. I still have to talk to people, don't stand at the head and poke the butt. You've got to be behind it. Got to be behind it. Another little trick is you want it to go forward in the chute, just quickly walk back by it like that. Just quickly walk back by it and it will go forward. Real, real simple little thing. This diagram works really well for moving just a single animal through a chute. And if you've got animals rearing up in the chute, back off. Give them space. Just back off. They're rearing because you're in the flight zone. Just back off of them. Give them room. Now, when you're right up close to the cattle, that point of balance will be at the shoulder. But to get a little further away, that point of balance where they go forward will be just behind the eye. And when you, if you want them to go forward, you've got to get beyond the, the, past the point of balance. There's an animal rearing in the chute. Back up, back up, back up. Now, one of the things I like in this facility is they've got a completely solid side on the outer part of it. And they can actually see the handler there on the inner side. But you've got to stay away from that, except when it's time to move them. Okay, how many people noticed that the ear of that animal is facing the guy? That's the kind of stuff I want you seeing. All right, now, as you notice something else in this picture? He's got a hot shot right there. So this brings up the whole issue about hot shots. It should never be a primary driving tool. Some people say, let's ban hot shots. There are some situations you might need one. You've got an ammo that absolutely won't go in the squeeze chute. Then you pick it up, use it once, and then put it away. Or you've got an animal down choking in a squeeze chute, or down at a truck stop. But it should not be in your hand all the time. That I'm going to be adamant about. Okay, they're bringing them down the alley, they start to turn back, you've got to back off them. This is another principle. You know, it's another basic principle. Okay, you work in their flight zone, you start to move them, they go where you want, back off. When they do what you want, back off. Teaching the horse to lead, when he steps forward, let go. You're cranking the tail, he moves, let go. And these are basic things, but we still have people not doing them. Yet, get rid of dogs around the chutes. I hate them, hate them, hate them, hate them. You know, out in the pasture is okay, but not around the chutes. Well, I've been nearly killed it <coughs> twice by cattle bitten by dogs. Now, here's a handy dandy way to get them to go forward in the chute, where you just step forward, quickly walk back by them. Make kind of a quick movement. I was teaching some students yesterday from the Hereford Association how to do this. And if they're lined up here, I said, you've got to just step forward and make a decisive movement. There's a confidence. And also, bigger guy, they tend to like, pay a little more attention, but there's a confidence. And animals pick up on your confidence. Are you afraid of them? Are you confident? I had a man one time say, he was a rancher, and he couldn't get this bull in the stock trailer. And so he went and got a pistol and put it in his pocket, and the bull went in the trailer. So why'd the bull go in the trailer? You had confidence. <laughs> Having that gun in your pocket, I'm serious. It changed, it changed the attitude just enough, and the bull picked up on that body posture. That's an important thing. Okay, crowd pens, you fill it half full. If you're using a tub, lay it out in a full half circle. So as they come on around, they're going back to where they come from. And I've got my humane handling books out there. also brought a few copies of a very simple little crowd layout where you just come up an alley, half circle tub, and you actually work the pivot point. You work at the pivot point at the gate. But the big mistake everybody makes is jamming too many cattle in there. 
and I really like those, <coughs> those nice long flags, and you can stand there and just get them out of there. An animal should go up there easily. If they don't go up there easily, there's something in here making them block. Probably a backstop gate. Well, then put a remote control on that backstop gate. Here's my little simple layout right here. And you just bring them up. Put the gate right about here. Stand here on this little platform. Take your flag and you work the pivot. I can get rid of all the catwalks. I can get a pile of expense out of it. I call that working the pivot. And when you come around here, I come around straight here, 30 degree angle there. And you work the angled side. And I do have some copies of this drawing. It's also on my website because there's getting to be a lot more interest now in cheaper facilities. Another thing that's happening is 20 years of temperament selection. Cattle are not as wild as they used to be. Okay, following behavior. Another principle is wait until your single file's got space in it. Then when you bring them up here, they just go on around and go right on in. And you also need to have enough single file shoot space so I can get four cows at least in the lead up. <coughs> There's nothing worse than having a lead up shoot that holds maybe one cow. You're constantly fighting them. You can't get any following behavior. Got to have enough lead up sh shoot space so I can put one in the squeeze shoot, four in the lead up, maybe five in the lead up. And use that following behavior. They always want to go back to where they come from. So you lay out a tub, complete half circle. They want to go back to where they come from. That is a basic principle of cattle behavior. Sheep you can handle in continuous flow. Cattle, it's small separate groups. And you've got to bring one in, bring a buddy along. Cattle don't like being by themselves. The lone animal hurts a lot of people. Now the one place where I still need that crowd gate. And yesterday I was out there with the Hereford students and we were putting like six, uh, you know, six, seven hundred pound bulls um, right in here. I'd put that crowd gate right there and I was just using the flag. I didn't even need to use the crowd gate. But I'd still have one because if I got a single in here going berserk, then I can swing that crowd gate around and prevent that single from, you know, jumping the fence or getting out. Yeah, the boy alone animal. Mr. Bison puts his tail up, you better watch out. Okay, we already talked about the use of the electric prod. I like flags. Now this prefab's got pipes on the ground. Cover them up with dirt. You know, it's easy, just cover those pipes up with dirt. They're gonna go in there much easier. Now the thing about a new experience, new things are both scary and attractive. They're attractive when the animal can voluntarily approach and they're scary if you just shove it in their face. And animals with a flighty genetics are most likely to get scared of something new that happens suddenly. Now I have a lot of people say to me, oh my animal's gentle at home, it went crazy at the show. But there's a lot of things at the show you don't have at home, like flags, bikes, and balloons. So you want to get your animal used to that stuff, decorate the pasture with balloons, let your animal voluntarily approach it. Another principle is, Make sure an animal's first experience with a four-wheeler, um, a trailer, new set of corrals or a squeeze chute is a good first experience. Just walk your animals through it. This is especially important to do with young heifers. There's some very nice work by Ronaldo Cook. He's published in the Journal of Animal Science, taking young heifers and walking them several times through the handling facility with nothing happening. And so that first experiences are good and they're getting better conception rates. That's the importance of acclimating animals to handling. Now the older cows, it doesn't work as well. I get asked all the time about four-wheelers. Make sure when you first introduce it, it's not chasing them. First experiences with new things need to be good. Now something like an umbrella opening, that will scare an animal. We already talked about the importance of first experiences being good first experiences. Now, animal memories are very specific. Here are two scientific studies that show this. <coughs> okay, you get the animals all used to people feeding range cubes. That didn't transfer over to the corrals. You see, when you're a visual thinker, 
Range cube feeding from a truck is a very different picture than corrals. You habituate a horse to a blue and white umbrella, boom, suddenly opening. That doesn't transfer to an orange tarp flapping around. Think about it. Umbrella and tarp look different. You know, they, they, they are specific in how they think. You've got to acclimate them to a lot of different stuff. Now, here's a horse that was terrified of black cowboy hats. White cowboy hats were fine. Now, other types of large black hats would probably be a problem. You see, they'll kind of um, make a generalization, something that sort of looks like it. But there's no way feeding range cubes sort of looks like a corral. But I've found that cattle that have been bashed on the head with a squeeze chute do recognize a slightly different head gait in another set of corrals. Yeah, that's something that looks enough like it. Also, they can make generalizations like girls are good, guys are bad. Sorry, guys. Um, that diesel-powered equipment's bad, gas-powered equipment's good. These sort of things. Men with beards are bad. Horses can get a problem where one type of bit is associated with being abused, so you get rid of that bit. See, the thing about these specific fear memories is if I can figure out what the fear memory is and, and just get rid of that thing, I can control what kind of bits I put in a horse's mouth. But I can't get rid of all the black hats. And Ronaldo Cook's also done some very interesting research on how cows react to wolves. And I talked to him at the New Mexico um, Western Section of Animal Science meetings, and he thinks that some of these cattle might actually get like a PTSD because he takes cows that never experienced wolves and exper exposes them to barking German shepherds and wolf pee. No reaction. He takes wolves that have been heavily attacked by, not wolves, takes cows that have been heavily attacked by wolves and exposes them to barking German shepherds and wolf pee. You get a gigantic stress response. So that shows right there that that's learned. Um, this is a scene, a picture I took during the movie. And um, all the movie equipment tended to make those other cattle on the pasture approach. But the movie company forgot to think about acclimating this tame show heifer. Hall or broke, tame show heifer that we were going to use for PR pictures. So I knelt down to do a nice PR picture and let her lick me. And they started flipping these reflector boards around. This heifer rose up. She was going to be on top of me. Reflector boards uh, don't act like white trucks. They'd assume that animals are trained to white trucks, so we're not going to have trouble with reflector boards. But reflector boards flip around all over the place. A truck tells you it's coming. It moves in a controlled way. So we had a trained animal on a movie set not trained to reflector boards. Really bad idea, because you want to design something to scare cattle, these things will. You know, you do stuff like slam them on the head, you're going to, you know, maybe lose some weight gains. My student, Ruth Woolley Woody, went out to 28 feed yards and scored handling and had some really good reports. Electric prod use was like a 5% average. Some feed yards didn't use them at all. A lot of good things. You know, there's, this is where there's been improvements. But the problem is nobody knows about it. We already talked about the man on the horse, the man on the ground. We already discussed that. Let's talk about bull behavior. <coughs> the number one cause of fatalities with livestock is bulls. Horses cause the injuries, but you don't die. Bulls make you die. And the most dangerous bull is a dairy calf that's been hand-reared, grows up alone, and when he gets to be 18 to 24 months old, attacks people because he's got to prove he's a man. The way to produce bulls that are safer is always rear them on a cow. Rear them on a cow, keep them in a group, then they grow up and they know they are cattle. And then they're not going to be interested in attacking people. And what a lot of people don't recognize is the broadside threat. And don't ever turn your back on a bull. It starts to threaten you, just back off. And you need to understand the broadside threat. This is what he does before he does the pawing. And if he's doing broadside threats towards people, I'd probably get rid of them. If you even think about attacking people, I'm going to get rid of you. Now, if you put the bull in the squeeze chute and you've done something that hurts and he's throwing a fit over that, I'm not going to get rid of the bull for slipping on the floor and getting scared. 
But out on the pasture, uh, he's threatening people. But the way you rear them helps prevent these kinds of problems. And then, of course, you can get mama cow get pretty protective, too. Now, there's some interesting things that are starting to be learned about this. Um, there's a trait of vigilance in the brain. <coughs> That's paying attention to your environment. And then there's the fear response or go attack something. Those are separate responses. Normally, an animal with a high up hair roll is vigilant. But I went down to the Lassiter Ranch, and they had selected for um, mamas that were really good mamas. They had a high hair roll, but they were not real flighty. See, I think they decoupled the traits. And some of the ranchers are in wolf country. They're selecting for, give me a calf every year, breed back quick, and if you attack people, you're gone. You've got to be nice to people. And we are, and of course, one of the things, cow the newborn, maybe keep calf in between you and her. We've got to raise the, um, make sure we don't have bull problems. Now, I'm a big fan of using handling measurements. Because this is a tendency where people go out to a cattle handling seminar, they go, oh boy, I'm going to do low stress handling. And a year later, they've slipped back to a bit more yelling, and the hot shot out, and stuff like that. And if you measure stuff, then I can tell, am I getting better, or am I getting worse? And I want to get that prod score down to like 2%. And you shouldn't have any animals falling. I want to get them walking and trotting coming out. And they should not vocalize when you catch them in the squeeze chute. Now, obviously, if you brand them, they're going to vocalize. But they should not vocalize in direct response to going into the squeeze chute or being caught. And the vocalization in Rue's study is low. It's something like you know, 3%. I can't remember the exact figures, but it's below 5%. Things are getting better. That's a real good thing. And here's some of her results right here. Study she did in 2014. Five and a half percent average prod score, a 1.3 percent vocalization score before procedures, falling at less than one percent. Worst feed yard was two. These were large, great big commercial feed yards. Uh, stumbling, six and a half percent. Miscaught, that's uh, across the head or the shoulders. Low. You know, these are figures to be proud of. Boy, I can remember the bad old days on cattle handling. This is something where things have improved a lot. And you look at where are we going to have welfare issues in the future? I used to say handling was number one. I'm going to now say mud and heat stress are your two big things. Big, heavy black cattle, they get hot. All right, now we've got time for questions. This is the part I really like. I'm going to pick somebody. Nobody has any questions. I want to pick somebody. Okay? Um, when, you, when you say vocalization, like going, uh. <laughs> no, I'm talking about vocalizations from the cattle. Oh. I'm talking about you catch them in a squeeze chute, let's say you bang them on the head. They go, uh, right when you catch them. Okay. I'm talking about the cattle vocalizing either when you're putting them into the squeeze chute, I mean, you just zap them hard with electric prod, they're going to move. You just slam that door on them or you squeeze them too hard, they're going to move. And if we're moving cows, can, we can, you would people I'm not, a, I have no problem with people talking to cattle. What I want to avoid is screaming and yelling at cattle. When people start to scream and yell, cattle no. Paul Hemsworth did a research study that showed that just talking, that, you know, saying, come on, boy, come on, that does, that's fine. But screaming and the swearing starts. And the thing is, they know the intent. And people start using a lot of bad language. Cattle don't know bad language. But what they're tuning into is the tone of the voice. And they know you are mad. And they react to that. Where if you're just saying, come on, boy, come on, boy, that's not mad. Well, one thing with bison, um, they don't like to line up the single file shoot. You know, sometimes people have a long single file shoot, gate them off, and by the time you get to number five, he's nuts. I think you're better off um, maybe bring five or six into the crowd pen, and I, I bring two in. One in a squeeze shoot, one can wait in line. That's it. And not have big lines of buffalo waiting in line. They do not handle that well. 
You know, if you do have a big long shoot with a lot of gates, I would just um, bring the two up, one in the squeeze chute, one can wait. And then I bring another two up, just quietly bring them up with the flag. I, you're going to have a much easier time. And the other thing is, you've got to make sure people stay out of the flight zone. And there's been some question about some low stress handling specialists want op like open sides on shoes. Well, if you have that, then you've got to have a people free zone around. The most important part to have solid is outer perimeters. I want to block all the outer perimeter distractions. I was just talking with um, a guy up in Montana, and uh, he's tried putting the solid sides just on the outer, outer, all the outer fences. He said it was working just great. And then he was working on the ground, working the flight zone, then only entering close when he needed to move them. Bison, you know, well, I probably need to cover more stuff up. And they can be trained too, you know, acclimated to going through facilities. Can you speak about working with a herd with youngsters and and the the mother and separating them, or what your recommendation would be about? Well, there's a real clever um, separation gate that Joe Stuckey has made, and there's actually a YouTube video of it. Joe Stuckey, S T O O K E, and I'm working on a on a new book on, you know, for small producers. I'm going to put a diagram with that in. I, it, works with a, it works well with animals that have got quite a bit of flight zone. It's kind of hard to explain it without a diagram. I don't have anything here to write on. But you, you, put the, you bring the cattle in, they come into a corral, come in an alley, and they're going to, of course, you put them in a corral, they're going to want to go right back out that entrance alley. And then as they're going back out, you're standing standing in the alley, and the calves tend to stay to the outside, and they slip out through a gate that's, that's got some bars missing. And there's it's Joe Stuckey calf sorting. I think if you type those keywords in, Joe Stuckey, S-T-O-O-K-E-Y, calf sorting. You can see the video, I'm, and I can draw you a diagram of that. I'm, I'll just have to draw it for you during when we're doing the book signing. I can draw that on how to make that. It will not work with your cattle, they're way too tame. You know, this side, we're going to make up another thing with just a gate and an alley. And sort those calves off. I don't think it's going to work on your tame pets. We're going to have to completely work with them with operant conditioning, training. The herding methods are too tame for most of the herding methods. <coughs> Okay, time of day, one thing, like you're switching pastures, you know how, how uh, mama cows like babysit the calves? You don't want to move them at the time that the calves are babysitting because then they're going to get separated. You want to do a, move them either before or after that time. And the other thing that's really important on changing pastures is the controlled movement so mamas don't run off and ditch the little babies. That's really bad. So I want to train cattle, if you're doing a lot of pasture switching, walk by me through a gate in an orderly manner. So what do we do if we've got cattle with really rotten manners, they push and shove on gates, they run like nut jobs out in the next pasture, well, we're going to have to start training them. And you stand there at the gate, I'm not going to open the gate. Now if I get them to just stand for an instant quietly, then I'll open the gate. This is standard operant conditioning. I get them to just do a little bit of what I want, then I open the gate, get them to come by me. Then I'll get them to stand a little bit longer nicely before I open the gate. I might have to stand there for 15 minutes before I open the gate. But I want to get some manners. I don't get manners hitting and screaming and whapping on them. You know, they, they're coming up and they're ripping feed off the back of the four-wheeler. No, that's not allowed. You don't want cattle to learn that feed bags rip. That's something you don't really want them to learn that. And if they already learned it, they're going to, okay, I want you to stand. You're going to wait nicely, and I'll put the feet down. So they're pretty rude and pushy. Then if I get them to just stand for half a second, then I chuck the feet down. Then I start to train them that when they stand still, they're not shoving, then I'll put the feet down. Because I think it's real important for these big animals to have manners, because the cows aren't being aggressive, but they can knock you over. They can knock the four-wheeler over, and you're under the four-wheeler. That's not funny. It's not good. So it's really important. I'm you know, doing pasture rotation, manners, controlled movement through gates, and make sure the cows are not babysitting when you go to move them. 
That's some simple things you can do. Or if you want to try to place cattle, do it at the end of the day when it's time to bed the calves down. They'll be more likely to stay. That's some work that Derek, uh, 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 Derek Haley did on it. That's something as simple, you know, you can try. Okay? There hasn't been much research on how important horns are. From what I've been hearing on predators, is the most important thing is a herd that stands the ground instead of just running and scattering. See, there's two ways to deal with the threat. They can stand their ground, all the strong animals out there facing the predator, or you can run and scatter. Now, with wolves, I mean, you know, the cows are going to get eaten up if they run and scatter. It's, uh, you know, and there's a lot of controversy going on right now the wolf country, and I think you're getting too many wolves. And, and uh, Ronaldo Cook's going to be doing a PTSD study on cattle. I think they actually are getting PSD, PTSD because their reproduction is just uh, awful. 10, 20 percent drops in AI rates, that's like horrible. Coyotes you can live with. You know, a certain small number of wolves you probably can live with, but there's a point where I, this is just not going to work. I've been getting all kinds of correspondence, like from upstate Washington, northern, uh, western Oregon, it's just a real mess. And you've got some people, you see then you've got wildlife people who want to preserve wolves, like to get rid of all the cattle. Well, the last thing we want to be doing is running the family rancher off the land. What people forget is we have huge amounts of land in this country, also in Australia, the only way you can raise food on that land is a grazing animal. You cannot crop this land. You cannot, um, uh, you know, uh, do any other way of raising food. There's not enough water for crops, or it's too steep and rocky. See, I think ranchers need to be getting out there, communicating with the public all the good things you're doing to preserve land. Another interesting thing I learned from a soil scientist. I thought this was super interesting that the very best cropland <coughs> in Iowa, all up through the middle of the country, was made by grazing animals, which would have been herds of bison. They would mow the grass, stomp it down, move on. Mow the grass, stomp it down, and then move on, migrate. Now, how did they live with the wolves? They migrated. Domestic cattle don't have that privilege. They can't migrate away from it. I'm going to pick somebody. How do you limit the stress of weaning? Limit the stress of weaning? Yeah. There's several things that you can do. Uh, one is fence line weaning. Because a cattle is more interested in the calf as being with mom than drinking from mom. You can use those weaning tabs. But you have to be careful not to leave those in too long. Now the disadvantage of those is you've got to put them in squeeze and put those things in them. But just fence line weaning. And along a good sturdy fence, probably going to need a hot wire or two on it. I um, can reduce a lot of the pacing and vocalization. See, the thing you don't want your calves doing is just pacing, eat, eating, and sucking dirt and stuff like that. One thing that Bud Williams has taught is walking with those cattle. You walk in the same direction that the animals are walking, you can actually slow them down, get some of that pacing to stop. It's also important to make sure the babies are in a familiar pasture. So you don't get the double whammy stress of going to a new place plus getting separated you know, from the mother. Those are all things you can do. Another big issue, when cattle prices got sky high, 40% of ranchers last year sent screaming, bawling babies off the market. We know that's a horrible thing to do. We know the thing to do is 45 days you got to vaccinate. 45 days before you ship them. Vaccinating a day of shipping is like useless. Feed yards hate that because you don't have time to get any titers. It's just worse than not doing it. 45 days before you ship them, get them vaccinated. We know how to prevent um, BRD. It used to be called shipping fever. It was the same thing. We've known how to do, fix that for years. And what about the problem is, is when cattle prices are sky high, I got the same price for cattle if I preconditioned them, vaccinated them, than if I didn't do a thing with them. It's a uh, that's a welfare problem and a production loss problem we've got right now. It's huge. And cattle get BRD, they lose one whole quality grade. One whole marbling grade is lost. 
because when they get sick, they've got to divert energy from making marbling to getting over being sick. And there's been like two or three studies now that have verified that result. One was done with show cattle, and the ones that got sick, one whole grade down. Maybe we'll do two more questions, and then I'll sign some books. OK? Um, <coughs> how do we improve the situation of the feedlots and uh, reduce, you know, how, how do we solve the, 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 the lack of balance there is between the amount of rangeland that needs grazing and the amount of cattle that is confined in the feedlots? Well, most of the cattle confined in the feed yards came from the rangeland. Well, you have to, you see that, see the, there's a reason why the feed yards are start out where they were. Because feed yards in Illinois turn into mud pies. And then when the ethanol started out, now we've got a lot of cattle going indoors in slats and things like that. I'm, I'm not that fond of that. The reason why the feed yards went to the high plains was to have a low enough rainfall so you wouldn't have a mud pie but have a relatively economical transportation of grain. Well, I lived in Arizona. We had tons of feed yards. The cattle did great in them. But the feed was more expensive because you got to ship it in from rail from further away. See, the places that are really wonderful to feed for big feedlots are not the grain growing areas. Yeah, you see, that's your problem. And, and I, you know, of course, then you got the problem of what are you going to do with all the manure? And, and a lot of the ranches aren't very good places to have feed yards. You can't get enough. You can't get the feed there. See those great big huge feed yards? They'll put them right on a railroad siding, and you got a train coming up there and unloading feed. You know, you might have you know 50 cars at a time come in there and unload. Ten or eleven year old alfalfa. That's getting a little bit outside my ex expertise, and I, I want to. You need to talk to somebody really good in nutrition, especially somebody local. Well, there can be some problems, some fescue and other things that can be problems. And I, you're, I, I'm going to have to defer to someone in nutrition. I, uh, and I would call up a bunch of people to find out about that. Because I don't want a bunch of dead cattle. And there's certain things that can really poison cattle. And I am not a nutritionist. And I would talk to some good people locally to tell you whether or not it's safe to, you know, to feed that. Now, there's some things that obviously are bad. I went out to inspect a feedlot for animal welfare, and their silage was pitch black. Their hay was pitch black. Yes, I threw a fit about that. I, yeah. That's obviously totally bad. And then, of course, I went to our nutritionist, two of our nutritionists at school, too, to. Yeah, but you need to find out somebody that uh, I am not a nutritionist. And, and uh, you've, got, you've got something you think is dangerous. You need to make sure you talk to some people that really know, because you don't want a bunch of dead cattle. Another question for you. Do cattle tell you, like, when you're out of feed, I mean, I know you look at grass, if it's two inches high, you're out of feed or something like that, but do they exhibit a certain behavior that tells you you're close to being out of feed? Well, they'll graze past you down to nothing and wreck it if you don't move them. You see, the whole principle of mob grazing is you make them kind of bunch tightly, mow it, but you don't want them to rip it out by the roots because you want to have... Um, uh, you don't want to kill all the plants um, food storage. You want to mow it, move them on to the next pasture, and you've got to give it enough time to fully recover. One of the big mistakes that's made with mob grazing is they don't give a paddock time to recover properly. It's very site specific, and I'd want to get really good local advice on what's considered fully recovered. I know just enough about it to know what a, how much trouble you can get into when things are done wrong. You can't generalize from around the country. But the basic principle is 
You want them to mow the grass. As Fred Provenza says, you don't want them to eat the best and leave the rest. You stock them tightly, so they got to eat the thistles and the nuts. That's great stuff, along with the candy. You know, mow it, maybe about like that. Then you move them off of there, and then you got to give that time to recover enough. Because if you don't, I went to a really good grazing workshop where they explained how the plant has stores down in the roots and just above the ground. And you can get away the first year overgrazing that. The next year you're going to be ruined because you ate up too much of the plant stores. So you get away with it in the short term, but you won't get away with it in the long term. And it's so, you know, site specific. Uh, but the principle is to mimic what the wild animals did. You see, the predators would keep the animals bunched. You see, in areas where there's no predators, animals spread out. And then they're going to cherry pick all the yummy, tasty stuff off. As Fred Provenza says, eat the best and leave the rest. Now, I've been in Colorado for 25 years. And when I first came to Fort Collins, the Canada geese would graze the cornfields in giant flocks. You know what's happened now that they're protected? I see single pairs of Canada geese all over the places, in the dumbest places, like the bank front lawn, <laughs> nesting under the steps in our building. And she hisses at you when you go in there. You never saw that when I first went there. They would be in big flocks. But now they've learned that there's no predators um, west of the freeway, no hunting allowed. And you see these pairs. They'll be on the median strip of the road. I never saw that when I first came to Colorado. Well, you see, when there's no predation, they don't bunch anymore. You see, in the mob grazing, where you had predators, that forced the bison to bunch. And how come they could live with the wolves and our cattle having so much trouble? They could migrate. Our cattle don't have that privilege. And so they would bunch, eat that grass, mow it, move on. Then that pasture had a whole year to recover. But I was just, I get that grass farmer magazine, and one of the biggest problems they were talking in there is people not getting that, letting that paddock recover enough. Get away with it for a while. Two or three early years later, you're in trouble because you've, you've killed the plant storage. They ate too much of it. And you've got somebody in your area that's really successful at that, you need to find out what they're doing because it's very, very site specific. Okay. <coughs> Your work is the best and most available information to help convince people to treat animals in the most humane way, or are there other people you would recommend as well? No, there's other people that have been doing some stockmanship training. One is Kurt Pate. Um, that's uh, C U R T Pate, P A T E. Kurt Pate's been doing that. He's been doing a lot of beef quality assurance training. And the first thing you got to do is to calm down. Now, there's a lot more you need to learn besides calming down, but that's the first step. Then you're not going to learn anything until you calm down. And then there's um, discussions in stock, low stress stockmanship, herding versus leading cattle. You get out here in the West, people are more herding. Go back east, everybody leads cattle. I think the best thing is to look for end results. I want nice, controlled movements, they're not running, babies don't get separated. Controlled movement through gates, that's really important. Well, if nobody has any other questions, I think I'll end there. I'll be around to you know, sign a few books, and I want to thank everybody for coming. Mm -hmm.